this guy franchise went into the studio with this other writer named Sly who was signed to Dre and they came out with a song called Suicidal which now you guys know is a song called Beautiful Girls and overnight we ended up rewriting franchise's whole album into a singing album which I participated in and we changed franchise's name from from franchise to Sean Kingston I spent the next year between SOS and Take You There writing some of the worst songs you ever heard in your entire life and you see a lot of people trying to sound like other shit that's working because they're trying to just like they think it's some sort of cheat code or something like that or they could capitalize up some sort of streaming algorithm yeah. but i think the ones that really cut through and the ones that become career today's career artists have a perspective and they don't give a fuck what other people are doing. they're just going to put out what they want to do and create a fan base doing that what's up what's up what's up it's brand man sean and i'm cory and we're back with another episode of no labels necessary podcast and today we have a very special guest evan bogart i mean songwriter creative executive owner and ceo of seeker music a mu music publishing company that differentiates itself based on its understanding of songwriters which we're going to get to because boy you've been around some hits man you've been around <laughs> <laughs> um like me and Corey were talking that you were basically on the pop side of our childhood so yeah. <laughs> it, it was pretty crazy to read based on just us having awareness of certain moments from the other side. It's like, well, I know that, I know that. Um, so I think a, a good place to start is just right when you had your very first moment in terms of the first song that, the first song that you felt like, hey, I think I could truly be a songwriter and be, uh, and be serious about this. Oh, I mean, that's such like, um, I guess that's like a two, a two part answer to that. And okay. so I'll explain what that, what that means. The, the first, the first was kind of like the God shot, like maybe I could do this. Mm. And then the second one was like, oh, I think I can do this. And so right. it's, it's a little bit of like a part A, part B to that. The first, the first was, and, and this is, you know, atypical to most songwriters journeys, my first cut ever was a number one song, right? Mm -hmm. So like, and also like maybe the third pop song, second or third pop song I had ever written. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, what were you writing before pop? Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I wasn't, really, and, and if you go, if you want to go way back in, in high school, I made it in LA in the nineties, I made a go of it trying to get signed as a, as, as a rapper. And so I was like pretty deep in like the hip hop, underground hip hop scene in LA, you know, around people like, you know, dilated peoples and styles and beyond. And, you know, will I am when he was an act band clan before black eyed peas and, you know, just the whole the whole kind of like uh, Jurassic Five, like the whole LA kind of underground zeitgeist of underground hip hop, right? And so I was pretty, pretty deep in that, going to all the, you know, different clubs, getting up in different, you know, whatever, ciphers, whatever you want to call it. And like, just really kind of immersing myself in that scene. And I tried to get myself a deal while I was working in the mailroom at Interscope in 90, in 96. And um, no surprise, no one wanted to sign me. <laughs> Um, so, so, but, but like, I, like, honestly, like I've written a lot of raps in songwriting later. So like, I actually, I actually am pretty good, but like, it was more about the fact that at the time, this was like a pre, in a pre Eminem world, I wasn't really bringing something that really stood out, um, and, and really grabbed people's attention. It was just kind of like, I, I, I fancied myself pretty much like, you know, the fifth member of a tribe called quest or like, you know, kind of like a like a poor man's AZ is what I kind of sounded like. So so it wasn't like it wasn't like I was getting signed anytime soon. So I didn't do that and I kind of hung up my shingles. I'm like, I'm gonna go work at Interscope. That's where I am. I'm in the mailroom and I'm gonna just be in the business side. I'm not gonna be a creative. And um and uh you know and then I started A and Ring a lot of hip hop records in the early nineties. I AR Eminem's first album, I AR, you know, Tupac's first posthumous album, Are You Still Down? and was doing a lot of that because that's what I really loved. So it wasn't really like I was writing then. I kind of like stopped writing at that point. Um, and I was at Interscope in the 90s as an A&R, then went to, to Warner. Um, I was a manager. I tried my hand as an agent. You know, I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to be in the industry. And while I was an agent, um, 
I, I actually got sober, uh, and which, which is, is a huge part of my story is, is my sobriety. But, but in my sobriety, I started feeling really creative again. And I decided to put together a girl group on the side while I was working at this agency and trying to get all of my friends who were producers to give me songs for them. But you know, like they're giving me songs, but like the shit that they couldn't get cut on other people, <laughs> right? Like they weren't like giving me like their, 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 like a, their, 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 their A songs, right? So, um, you know, I, uh, I basically was kind of forced into trying to write the songs for the group myself. And the second song I wrote for them you know, the group didn't get signed, but we ended up selling the songs and the second song I wrote for them became SOS for Rihanna. And so there was Man. this light bulb moment of like, oh, like I can be a creator, I can create music, but it's not gonna be the way I thought it was. I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be the front man, but like maybe I should give this a go, you know? And so I quit my job. My mom was like freaked out and went to go be a full-time songwriter. Although I did have the number one song in the world. <laughs> but but um, I basically stayed at the agency for like four months because I was scared to like disappoint my parents. And like and like every day I was getting calls from from my the guy I, wrote, I did the song with, J, J, a producer named J.R. Rodham. And he'd be like, dude, you gotta leave. I need you in the studio, I need you in the studio. And like, I was like, I can't, my mom will kill me. I got a job and insurance and you know, all that stuff. And uh, <laughs> And then finally they were like, what's it gonna take for you to leave? And I was like, I don't know, put me in the studio with Britney Spears. And the next week, JR and I spent a week in Vegas working on the Blackout album, because Britney was a huge fan of SOS. And so I, I, I honored my word, I came back, I quit the agency and went to go write full time. But that's why it's a two part answer, because what I learned really quickly was one, first of all, I had no idea how I did that in the first place, because I had never written pop songs. And all of a sudden the second song I wrote becomes a, a global hit, right? Like a number one song. So I'm like, shit, I better learn how to do that. Well, I, I don't know what I did, <laughs> but I better figure it out quickly before people realize that I don't no idea what I'm doing. And the second thing was, yeah. everybody's looking at you like, all right, well, what else you got, right? Like now you're on the clock. You had a hit song, you're a new hit writer, and now you're on the clock. Like you better bring something quick. And thankfully, JR, after he signed me, I was the first person that JR signed and he created this company called Beluga Heights. The next person that JR signed was this rapper from Miami named Franchise. And Fran he signed him to Epic Records. The album was cool, but one night this guy Franchise went into the studio with this other writer named Sly who was signed to Dre. And they came out with a song called Suicidal, which now you guys know is a song called Beautiful Girls. And overnight, we ended up rewriting Franchise's whole album into a singing album, which I participated in. And we changed Franchise's name from, from Franchise to Sean Kingston, right? And the, uh -huh. so fortunately enough, that happened because I ended up having the opportunity to write the song Take You There, which became my second hit. And at that point, it's like, I, I feel like I got off the schneid, you know? It's like, I got this moment where I was like, okay, now I have a second one. Everyone get off my backs. I can do this, right? And so that's why it's a two-part answer. <laughs> SOS gave me the belief yeah. that maybe I could do this. Take you there, gave me the confidence like, okay, I know what I'm doing. Did you figure something out, right? Like, like you said, when you wrote SOS, you're like, I don't really know how I did that. It's kind of scary, but I spent, did it again. I spent the next maybe year. The time. Yeah, I spent the next year between SOS and Take You There writing some of the worst songs you ever heard in your entire life. <laughs> because, because I was, ch first I was just chasing SOS, right? That's the first thing you do is you're like, okay, I gotta write, I gotta figure out how I did that, right? And you don't really have an, you, re you don't really have an identity. I haven't, I didn't spend years toiling as a songwriter trying to figure out who I was and what my, what my brand of writing was or like who, what my perspective was, right? I just kind of like had a, a natural ability and an instinct that I didn't know I had and an intuitiveness and I needed to figure out how to tap into it again. And so I went into like, you know, the 10,000 hours thing. Like I went into like <laughs> super hyper mode, like three sessions a day, seven days a week, burn myself out to death because I was trying to figure out how to be, how to write, how to write songs, how to recreate magic. And after, you know, putting yourself in the room with people that are better than you. Like I always say to new writers, write up to the room, right up to the room. Don't go into a room and think you're the best in the room shut the F up and listen. 
Like there's someone in the room who knows better at something better than you, something, right? And so you might be the best at melody, but someone might be better than you at lyrics or, you know, someone may have better concepts or someone may be better than you at melody, you know? And so you go into a room and you, and you find rooms where somebody is better than you. So they challenge you and you write up to it. And fortunately, JR, you know, with Sean and, 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 and Rihanna and then Leona Lewis and a few other things became one of the hottest producers in the world and then became the hottest producer with Derulo. But um, fortunately enough, we were able to pull in writers like, you know, Neo and Cara Diaguardi and, and Casey Livingston and all, you know, who wrote like Stick With You for Pussycat Dolls, like just amazing writers that would come in. And we were in the studio like next to the clutch. So I was always around like Carrie Hilson and like Rico Love and like, you know, Balewa and Zeke and like, and like just idolizing these writers and just learning from them and absorbing. And eventually I caught on. <laughs> and even Take You There, you know, which was with, with, um, with Rock City, with Our City, you know, with, with T-Ron and, and his brother, like, you know, they're amazing. I mean, T-Ron just won Songwriter of the Year and it's like 20 years later, you know? So it's, it's um, you know, I just think that like new writers, like they always try to go prove themselves. I'm like, don't, like, like just go learn, man. Shut up. <laughs> and that's what I did. I listened. I absorbed. I absorbed and I figured it out. Let's take a quick commercial break to talk about Spotify Discovery Mode, one of the most powerful tools when it comes to marketing music today because it puts your music in the algorithm on Spotify to be listened to along with music similar to you without you having to run ads, without you having to do any content at all, which is why a lot of artists tell me they love it. But a lot of artists don't necessarily have access to Spotify Discovery Mode unless you're a two loss user because with two loss all artists have a fair shot at getting access to spotify discovery mode just by submitting through them and they pitch all of their artist music to spotify to be considered for discovery mode so if you don't meet the criteria if you are in the position where some of the larger artists are sign up for two loss distribution at two loss.com that's t-o-o lost.com because that's just one of many extremely valuable features that two loss offers to his artists to make their lives easier and you can try out two loss for free by using the code no label that's n-o-l-a-b-e-l when you sign up so go to two loss.com and check out how you can get your music heard everywhere this is it's so interesting to hear because I mean, you read up on you and you have so many names attached to you names and big songs I mean you know, the Rihanna that you just went through, the Sean Kingston, the the Halo with Beyonce. I mean, just the names of just Adam Levine, you so many the Tupac. There's so many names. Like this is like the industry, the pop industry. Everybody that we know and on hip hop and pop, there's so many names that are in your um attached to you, whether it's because you have ownership over catalog, whether it's you wrote the song, whether you managed. So you've done so much in the industry. In general, well, like, how do you think about finding your groove in the first place? Because this songwriter thing, it sounds like you stumbled on it. Like you, as an artist, as a rapper, you knew you wanted to be that, but then you, you're like, ah, okay, that didn't quite work out. You went and did some other things, right? And eventually found the songwriter. And now you're also like in the publishing space. Do you just see it as like a constant evolution and you, over, you just get in where you fit in. There's no way to just say, "Hey, this is exactly what I am," or I don't know. Like, how do you find that path in music, or how maybe it's for you? Maybe not how you advise somebody else to do it, but how did you well, see I mean, moving throughout the music? End? I think I think there's a couple answers to that. I think, um, you know, I think the I think I I am somebody who kind of like, and maybe it's because of the way my career trajectory the arc was like i i am i need both the business and the creative to fulfill my soul i can't just do one or the other and at a certain point i realized that like i just loved working with other cre music creators as much as i liked creating the music myself and so i needed i needed to create I needed to understand the business side, which I obviously highly recommend to anyone who's a creator, a music creator. Like if you don't know your business, you can't figure out how to build a business off of your creation, but also you'll probably get taken advantage of because you don't know what the hell's going on. 
So I think it's really important that even if you don't want to be in, want to be a business person, you at least learn the business of your music. But for me, I think it's because I started off wanting to be a creative and then really falling in love with being in the business and then falling in love again with being a creative that I have this like dual mindset, this like left brain, right brain codependency. <laughs> Maybe it's unhealthy. I don't know. It's an unhealthy relationship between the halves of my brain. Um, but the, um, the, this, this, this yearning to, to want to be in there to create that, like, it, it's like an expression and it kind of, it, it, it fills my soul in one way. And then I love to build. I love to help people build. I love to just create businesses. And I, someone says me, says an idea and all of a sudden I can see what it looks like when it's successful. And now, now if I can see that I have to help it get there. Like, like I'll be haunted if I don't, right? If I can actually see what the end result looks like and I don't actually go after it, it will, it, it will like haunt me forever. So I always say I have a terrible, I have a terrible uh, habit of making my hobbies into businesses because I love my hobbies and then I love them so much. And I real, all of a sudden I see that there's, oh, this, we can actually make money doing this. And then all of a sudden that becomes a business. Um, but, but, it, but it's true. It's, it's, you know, for me, like, I don't know if it would have been the same had somebody come to me and said, look, kid, you're not going to get signed as a rapper, but maybe you should try writing for other people. When I was 18, no one said that, right? I was, I was shopping my demo while working in the, in the mailroom at Interscope in the nineties. Right. And like, I just was like, I guess I'll just do this then. No one gave me the option. I didn't know it was an option in the back then. Like yeah. I, it wasn't songwriting as a career is like, much more of a commercial thing now than it was even 10, even 10 years ago. Right. You know, like I think, you know, my, my mom who was also in the music industry before I was born really, um, she, she, you know, she had a lot of friends who were songwriters, but she never really like directed me in that way. And my, my stepdad who was a doctor, he just never, I don't, I don't think he still understands what I do. <laughs> you know, he's like, what do you write words or something? Like he doesn't really, you know, it's like, so it wasn't like somebody was like pushing me into being a writer. Like it wasn't like my mom was like a Carol King or like a Diane Warren or something, or, you know, or a baby face was my dad or something where it was like, you know, you're, you're the son of a songwriter, go write, you know? So I was this, I was actually the son of a music industry legend in the seventies who passed away when I was four. And so I actually thought I would grow up and run a record label. You know, and then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I can rap and people like the shit I do. So maybe I'll do that. And I was, you know, you, you know, making beats and when I was 13 and DJing parties and shit. So it was like, you know, I was, you know, I think that it was going to be one of those two. So my advice though to people is, is, is to know both sides, right? Like when I started working at Interscope and I decided I wasn't going to be a, a rapper, I went to recording school at night. And on the first day there, the teacher said, raise your hand if you want to be a producer. And half the people in the class raised their hand. And they said, raise your hand if you want to be an engineer. And the other half the people raised their hand. It was the Los Angeles Recording School. And uh, I'm the only one who didn't raise my hand for either. I didn't want to do either. I didn't want to be a producer or engineer. I just wanted to be the A&R person. I was in the mailroom, mind you, at the time. But in my head, I was an A&R person already. I just wanted to be an A&R person who understood what they were saying in the, in the studio. I didn't want to be the jackass right. who says things like make it more purple or like, you know, like, I don't know. Can you, can you, can you take the vocal of that and imprint like some dumb shit, right? Like for me, I wanted <laughs> to be able to talk the talk. So I learned how to run a recording studio for the purpose of understanding how to talk to songwriters and producers. Like that's how, so for me, I was always like, how do I understand the other side? It'll make me better at my job. And so that's the, that's the advice I give people. I give people now is, if you don't want to do both, you should, you should make it a habit to learn the other side because you will connect with and relate and be able to understand how to do the other side and it'll make you better at your job. If you do want to do both, I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's, a, it's essential to, to, to do that. But I think it's all about balance and I think it's about understanding how to root your business in your, create, in your creativity. I think the mistake that some people do when they try to do business and creativity is they create a business that has nothing to do with their creativity. So now they have two full-time jobs that have no integration and no alignment with each other. And now that's when they say, Oh, you know, Jack of all trades, master of none. Right? Like, because 
that all the trades, they don't have anything to do with each other, right? Like there's no, inter, there's no, there's no intersection. For me, creation right. of music sits at the center. That's the nucleus. And everything I've built off of it, whether my writing career or other businesses, is an extension of that. <laughs> I love that. Just to go back very quickly, you said something that's interesting. Um, your mom was worried about you putting your job and basically really getting back into this music thing when she had music industry experience. Yes. Yeah. Most people's parents That's don't why. have any kind of music industry. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, I'm she, I'm I was sure. like, I'm going to go quit, quit. My, you know, I was a music agent, so I wasn't like not in the music industry, but like I had like an office and I got a paycheck and I had an expense account and I had insurance. And she's like, you know, this newly sober kid who's like getting his life back together and has this job that's pretty stable. Um, and he wants to go quit it to go chase his dream of being an unemployed songwriter. <laughs> um, and she had enough business experience to know that's a terrible idea. <laughs> and then 99% of the time would have been a terrible idea with the exception of I already had a hit yeah. song and I was going walking right in the room with, with JR and all of these artists. So my, my, it's still risky. Still could have literally not, I could have never gotten another fucking cut ever again, right? Like it could have never, never happened. I would have been calling back to the agency saying, can you please hire me again? Like that was definitely a possibility. But uh, I had an opportunity to step into and, and if I could make it work, I, I really could make it work. And I mean, honestly, I, I, the universe, I think the universe had better plans than me being an agent. I think, the, I think my story wasn't supposed to be that. My story was supposed to be this. My story was supposed to be a songwriter who advocates for other songwriters. That's who I am, and that's that's what I think I'm always supposed to be. Hey, well, yeah. this is definitely what you are now. But my mom, my mom did, my mom did say one thing to me, which I didn't listen to for what for like three years. I did it for three years. She said, "Whatever you do, don't be a manager." <laughs> <laughs> and she she just knew. She's like, "You are the." You are the first person to get blamed for anything to go wrong, and you are the last person to get celebrated for anything to go right. <laughs> she, she told me. Uh, can you share a little bit about your mom really quickly and, and, and some of the artists she's managed just for, I mean, I think the context is going to be amazing for. Yeah, uh, so my mom, you know, my, mom right. my mom discovered, my mom and her partner discovered a group uh, called KISS, a rock group called KISS. And she, she managed this group Kiss, and that's how she met my dad. My dad ran a record label in the seventies called Casablanca Records, and she signed Kiss to my dad's label. And my dad had also signed like Parliament and Down a Summer and Village People, and you know a bunch of other big acts and stuff like that. So Kiss was my mom's act, and that's how they met. We fell in love. So yeah, when she was speaking, she was speaking from the realest of experience. I follow that same advice, just to be real. <laughs> I, I, I will tell you this, though. Like, I, I was a manager for a certain amount of time, and you know, thankfully, my relationships with my clients were really good. And I didn't feel like I didn't feel like the first to get blamed. That, like, I'm no part of the team. But I have seen a lot of manager friends of mine, close friends of mine, you know, who have put in years on an artist just get blown out overnight. You know, and it's like, and it's, it's heartbreaking, you know, spend 10 years developing an artist, breaking an artist and all of a sudden get fired, you know, and then you're chasing commissions. It's, you know, managers, you know, it's, it's a, it is a, it is a, it is a brave job in this business. You put in a lot of work and there's not a lot of protection. <laughs> That's a good word. I love that word, Tilly. <laughs> and Jacar, you sound like you're uh, about to say something. What were you saying? Yeah, I kind of wanted to uh, get back on the creative side a little bit. I, I don't remember if it was a, your bio I was reading through or, or an interview or something you did, but um, you were telling a story about how one of your friend's injury led to one of your bigger songs. And the, the takeaway I got from that clip was about, or that post was about, you know, taking advantage of accidental moments in music, how sometimes the accidental moments create the, the most the, the most beautiful work. Can you Can you tell that story and walk through that framework a little bit more? 
it, they all do. Like all of the moments are accidental. I mean, I feel like most hits ever in the history of music all happened because it was like the the fate or kismet or whatever you want to call it. Like I I think I think it's a, 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 you know music always seems to have the answer when you when you're looking for one. You know, and I think in this case, um, when I was an agent, um, I was working with a band, a brand new band uh, called. Well, we know them now as One Republic, and uh, they hadn't blown up yet. And they were one of the bands I was fortunate enough to work with, and I became really tight with the lead singer, a guy named Ryan Tedder, who obviously is a huge uh, star in his own right, super producer, writer, everything. And um, Ryan and I, Ryan was actually one of the people who was giving me songs for the girl group that I couldn't, <laughs> that I that I needed to write the songs for. Um, and um uh yeah so ryan um ryan this is a few years later like i had i had left the agency i had had some success ryan had now had some success you know with one republic with apologize and and you know being signed to tim and um obviously writing stuff like bleeding love for leona lewis and some other really really big records and uh ryan was on tour with one republic they were on a on a on a uh college tour and he ruptured his Achilles playing basketball on an off day in Detroit or outside of Detroit. And uh, they had they had surgery there and flew him back to L.A. and canceled the rest of the tour. And his first day back after he got back, um, I went over to keep him company. And as soon as his wife left for work, he was like, let's go right. <laughs> and he like hopped up on his crutches and went into his like studio bedroom. And uh, I was like, which we write? And he's like, Jay Brown said that they're looking for a love song for, for Beyonce. You know, at the time, like, like the worst kept secret in the world was Beyonce and Jay-Z were together. Like, I don't know if you remember that moment. It was like, they were like, they weren't out, but like everyone knew. Anyway, but so we were like, what would Beyonce and Jay-Z want to say to each other? You know, so we were sitting there and, and um, I, I keep like this really in-depth list of concepts and lyrics um, in my computer. And I was going through all of them and my finger my finger landed on the word, literally landed on the word halo, just as Ryan played these angelic chords. He hit it at the same time, like as if we were like in the same wavelength, you know, like it was like, I was like, what about like a halo? Like if you were talking about like, how do you shelter someone? How do you embrace somebody? How does somebody like a Beyonce and a Jay-Z who are not publicly talking about being together, how do they feel safe with each other? Like what do they want from each other? They want safety, they want knowing that that they can trust each other, you know, um, and and they they know, they both they both understand the privacy and 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 the difficulty that that brings being as famous as they are, and so we were like, what would be what would be something that felt like embracing? And my finger light, and I was like, what about a halo? And Ryan was like, oh, and we kind of looked at each other and we were like, yeah. And then three hours later, we had that song done. Ryan sent it to Jay Brown an hour later he emailed back and he said please hold this for Beyonce and um, yeah and it's really kind of all she wrote I mean I'd say that it took us months to finally get it recorded and, and hear it and stuff but uh, I mean it, that was just one of those moments you know Ryan always says he ruptures Achilles again to write another halo <laughs> you know like um, uh, but like again like he doesn't that, that, that accident doesn't happen that song doesn't get written right um, no. well, yeah. um, and I think that that's, um, you know, like even SOS with Rihanna, like when we sold that song also to Jay Brown, by the way, at a different label, Jay Brown, shout out to Jay Brown, changed my life twice. But when Jay Brown was running Island Def Jam with Jay-Z and they bought that song SOS, it was for Christina Milian. It wasn't for Rihanna, right? And Christina decided about a month later, she didn't want to make a pop record. She went and made that, an R&B record, I think with like Dre and Vidal, I want to say or something. It was like with Say Ah or whatever. I forget what, uh, what I forget what, there's a big R&B hit song. Uh, I right? yep. but, but, um, but then I was like, oh, well, I guess that song's dead. And then Jay Brown's like, actually, we have this other artist. So Christina Milian cuts SOS. Maybe it's not the same song, right? Maybe it's not a hit like it was for Rihanna. Like, it's just, you know, the, the way that these songs play out, it's like, it's always, it's always what drives me crazy when someone's like, yo, we just wrote a smash. And I'm like, no, you didn't. I'm like, no, it sounds like a hit. And I'm like, okay, it sounds like a hit, but you didn't write a smash. Like, do you know what stars have to align for a smash to be a smash? Like, all the things that have to go right. First of all, the song has to be amazing. 
Okay, fine. The right artist at the right moment in their career needs to cut it. It needs to be a single for them. They need to have the right team to support it. They need, the label's got to be behind it. And then there's got to be the right competition or le- lack of competition at radio at the time. And they got to not do some dumb shit in the meantime as well. Because I always say, could you imagine you were the guy who had Chris Brown's next single the night before he beat up Rihanna? You know what I mean? Like, I'm just saying, like, shit happens sometimes. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh man, I'm about to have this massive smash with Chris Brown. And then, you know, or whatever. And, you know, there's a million other stories like that, but it's a, that's a low hanging fruit one. But like, I'm just saying like, so many things have to align. And so for me, when you say like happy accidents, I think they're all, every hit's a happy accident. I don't think one hit is not a happy accident. So many things have to be right for a hit to be a hit. Yeah, man. So that makes me want to ask you this then, right? Because I think so many artists of our generation look at artists from the 2000s and the 90s and before as almost like creative perfectionists. Like we just assume that because everyone seems to agree that the music was higher quality, that the people there that put those things together were were just meticulously planning everything. And, And you're saying that you know, a lot of the best songs or artist moments in general are, are accidents or, or kind of happy surprises. So like, how do you feel about yeah, the artist pursuit of like perfection? You know what I'm saying? Like, do you feel like it's a moot point? No, well, I, I, okay, well, two things. One, like think about, forget my songs for a second. Think about a song like Irreplaceable, hmm. right? That was Neo's song. Neo wanted it. Beyonce didn't even want to cut it. Fine, I'll cut it. It becomes a hit. But I'm just saying like, like, you know that, that I just saying like those things ha- those things happen. You hear those stories all the time, right? And so I think that like, I, I, would that song been a hit from Neo? Yeah, maybe. Would that song have been as big of a hit for Neo? Probably not, right? Like you know, the ca- right? I mean, and so I think I think that um, it's not it's not necessarily about like a higher quality. Also, I think let's be straight. Every artist, every writer, every producer, no matter how great they are, I don't care, like, who, whoever like, has written terrible songs, has written shit songs. You just don't hear them. <laughs> I think the amount of product coming out now is probably too much. I think people are probably putting out too much music. I think people could be a little more discerning about what they release. Like, if you have 19 songs on an album, but 10 of them are crazy, just put out 10. Like, why, like, like do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like, there's a, there's a lot of excess where it's like, you could say, oh, they were more potent back then. Like uh, the Thriller album. I love this, you know, uh, nine songs on the album, seven of them hit singles. The seventh single was Thriller. The seventh single was like, what should we do 18 months after the album's out? I don't know. Let's go shoot a Halloween video, put out Thriller. Okay, that sounds good. Like, what? Up? There's only three songs left in the album. Which one should be the next, the seventh single? Thriller should be the seventh single. Like, that's insane. That song is like one of the greatest songs I've ever written. But all eight, all, all six songs before that are also six of the greatest songs I've ever written. I guarantee, and by the way, the other two that are on the album, not my favorite. I think it's like, um, I forget what they are, but like, it's like, they're just kind of like, man, they're all right. <laughs> like, even Michael writes some all right songs, right? And so, like, I, but I guarantee you there are songs that didn't make those nine songs. There's probably 20 other songs that Michael threw out. And I just think that people don't, people don't throw out songs anymore. They put out as much content as possible, as opposed to just really, really cutting the fat, putting out, you know, just the, the filet, you know, the caviar, just drop that shit. Right. And like, you know, so I, I do, I, I don't know if it's like the quality of the creating was better back then. I think there was more mystery. There wasn't streaming. There wasn't social media. There wasn't internet. I think, I think that there was, it was the ability to create a narrative and to keep the mystery of that narrative and to share only bits and pieces along the way and not have beholden to this um, short, short, you know, short-term attention span society that constantly needs content given to him, given to him, given to it over and over again. And the same thing, you know, with social content, like where you have to tell everything about your life. I feel like all of that creates uh, creates an environment. It perpetuates itself, you know, and creates an environment where people are like, 
you know, I'm not saying it's wrong. It is what it is. Like, and, and there's amazing creators who, who are, who are, who are successful and putting out amazing music now in the, in the context of that. But when, when we think about like, was the quality of music better back then, there were also terrible songs from terrible artists that you've never heard of back then. And that's because they were shoved under the rug and you can't find them because there was no internet, no social media to expose how bad they were. And the people weren't dropping 20 song albums. And so I think that people were able to create that story and craft it and tell and, and put out what they wanted to put out. That doesn't mean that people can't be prolific today. There are so many prolific artists today and I'm so bullish on because of the creator tools and the, you know, and the music creator platforms and all of the ability to, for people who live, who don't have to live in LA and Nashville and Miami, you know, and Atlanta to get discovered anymore. Right? Like the, the ability for music to be such a global and such an instantaneous thing gives us the opportunity to discover so many more prolific artists, but also it gives, it gives all of the non-prolific artists the same ability to put music out and, and flood, flood, the, flood the, the, the streaming service. So there's more music be coming out, but there's also more opportunity to find more prolific music. So there's, it's a double-edged sword, you know? I, I, but I don't, I don't buy that the music was better crafted back then. I think that we just had, I think when I say we just because I was in the 90s and we were able to do it in the 90s, but my parents and before them had the ability to, to be more protective about what you heard and what you saw and what, and, and, and you didn't get to see the bad shit all the time, you know? Hearing you talk about that, it makes me think that, you know, it's really just human nature and business models. That's what I think when I hear that, because the reality is, is back then, if you wanted to, you really couldn't put out that much music because it's, the shelf space you were putting it on real shelves in the retail stores and, and things cost like that but cost you know, have this un right exactly so it's hard to create very expensive so you know, how can you create that much music and then get it out the the cost that it was so competitive so you had to only make sure the best of the best whereas today it's like it's very cheap so we're just going to put out wherever we can and figure out which one of these are going to work. Yeah, we're, we're going to throw it up. We're going to throw it at the wall and see what shit sticks. Like that's like, unfortunately, yeah. so many people's marketing plans, <laughs> right? Like, and also like artists who are like, um, like that's the other thing. Like people, I want people to take risks and just oh, have a point of view and be who they are. And you see a lot of people trying to sound like other shit that's working because they're trying to just like, they think it's some sort of cheat code or something like that, or they could capitalize up some sort of streaming algorithm yeah. if it sound like another artist. But I think the ones that really cut through and the ones that become career, today's career artists have a perspective and they don't give a fuck what other people are doing. They're just going to put out what they want to do and create a fan base doing that. Like someone like a SZA or even a Money Long or like, you know, John Bellion or like, there's these people who are just so prolific in their creating. They're just, they just stick to what they do. And as eventually people are going to catch up and come along with it. Right. And I think, I think you see a lot of people that are like, I'm going to put out this song, but oh, that didn't work. So I'm going to put out a song that sounds like this. No, nope, that didn't work. So I'm going to put out a song that sounds like this. And then you have no, like, there's nothing there's nothing like no one knows who you are. Like, how can you create a fan base if 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 you're not targeting a fan base if you don't know who your fans are? Um, and so, I think that the ability to create cheaply and or in some cases almost completely for free on certain platforms, and the ability to be able to put music out again for like if you want through like a tune core for like fifty bucks or something a year, right? Like, um, and and the lack of mentorship, the lack of the lack of a, the accessibility to people who know how to help develop and and I just the lack of education and mentorship in music and music business that's accessible by the mass. Um, that whole combination just puts us in a perfect storm of you know flooding 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 streaming services and, and everything with. Uh, just a bunch of average music. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know, you touched on so many things that are just 
piecing things together from the old versus new industry in terms of models, how much and how people have created. Even when you, you were talking about the music that gets created by happenstance or a string of things pulling together, I literally, I don't know, maybe like two hours ago before we were on this call, I was scrolling through Instagram and I can't remember the woman's name, but she is the one who wrote the song back to life, back to reality. Like that song right there, known it forever. It's awesome. actually Fresh Prince. They make a huge of uh, that song, right? Yeah. And she was like, the song was written because she had a near-death experience and then came back. Right. And when she was in that near death experience, like, I, I don't know if she had passed out when unconscious or whatever happened. She, um, <laughs> whatever she saw, she said it was so beautiful. She actually hated it and was somewhat depressed about kind of like being alive again. It was, it was like, it was, it was this whole weird instance, but the fact that it came from a real experience and she was like really sad, but it ended up being to an upbeat song. Uh, and now it's like more of a hit, but that, she wasn't even trying to make it like an upbeat song that was more the the producer's choice it's like you hear these things and again it's just so many people involved so many um elements so many variables what what do you think in terms of especially an artist today how they should approach from a songwriter creative standpoint protecting your creative and not falling into i just have to write a bunch of music but also acknowledging i do want to experience some level of success. I want to make money from this. I want to be seen and acknowledged for my work. Yeah, the age old, uh, age old dilemma. Uh, feed the soul, feed the belly, right? Like that's the whole like, uh, thing. I think, I think that like, I think if you're an artist, you need to have a perspective. You need to stand for something. I think that's never changed. I think that's been for, for forever, right? Even you know, even um, even the greatest pop artists of all time, who maybe you didn't think stood for something, they stood for making you feel a certain way. Like the idea is that you want to make people feel. Music is you make music to make people feel something and relate to it, connect to it. Even if that's making you feel like you want to dance, making you feel like you want to smile, or making you feel like you want to celebrate. Right? You don't have to. Feeling doesn't have to be sad. Right? Feeling can be happy. And so I think if you're an artist, you need to you need to bring your own perspective to it, or you need to bring something that feels like your own perspective to it in the sense that like you relate to it in, in a personal way. Um, that doesn't mean you need to sacrifice commercial commerciality. If you, that's what you want to be a commercial artist and you want to have commercial success, um, you can do both. I mean, we've seen that. We've seen that even more l lately. Um, you know, telling stories that feel really personal, whether there's someone else's stories or your own stories that make people feel a certain way, connect to them in a much deeper way and still have chart success. I mean, I'll, I'll say SZA again, cause she's, you know, so good at it, but like, you know, um, there's so many people doing that. I think that, um, you can do both. They're not, they're not mutually exclusive of each other. And I think sometimes they, they people think that they think, well, if I'm going to write like a real record. I can't have a hit doing it. That's not true. It's, it's it's never been true. It just means you're scared to write a hit doing it, at, or your or the other way. Now, if you're a songwriter and you that's your career, you just want to be a, a songwriter. Unfortunately, us songwriters don't get paid if we don't write hits anymore because streaming services aren't paying what they should be paying, um, and labels are taking too much of the pie, and so publishers and songwriters don't get paid like they used to get paid in, you know, in, from mechanicals um, before streaming existed. And so as a songwriter, a professional songwriter, you, you got to kind of shoot for writing the hits, right? It's also, you want to write stuff that fulfills your soul, right? And you want to write stuff that makes you feel good. But like, if you're not having either massive streaming hits, you know, or radio hits in songwriting, it's going to be really hard to sustain that career for a long period of time. Because it yes. just doesn't pay like it used to, unfortunately. Um, and there's a lot of really, really smart and uh, and proactive, passive, passionate people that are trying to fix that. But it's just taking some time. While we're while we're on that, can you talk about um, 
I, just your I advocacy for it. the. Uh, go ahead, John. I think you might be freezing a little bit. No, there was a delay on my side. Okay, all right, it's all good. Um, yeah, but what? Yeah, go ahead. What I was gonna ask Evan is like, like I said, just in the the research around you before this interview, just saw that you were a huge advocate for songwriters getting more respect and kind of more what they're owed in the industry in general. Um, like I saw you were the one that pushed for the songwriter award at the Grammys. Like we obviously have that now. How much more work do you feel like songwriters have to do to kind of gain that position and the respect that you feel like um feel like is needed? And, you know, if it's something you can speak on, what are some things that, that are currently in motion, whether from the ground level with actual songwriters or whether from a, a top end level that like us as an audience can kind of be aware of and possibly possibly help with? Yeah, I mean, um, look, I mean, they, they, you know, s several years back now, they passed the Mu Music Modernization Act, which which uh, created the Music Licensing Connect, Mechanical Licensing Connect Collective, MLC, which is uh, a step in the right direction, you know, that collects and pays the songwriters and is funded by the funded by Spotify's and Apple's in the world and creates kind of a governing, uh, you know, uh, like um, go creates a governing protocol for how songwriters can get paid. Also, there's been a lot of legislation that has increased the rates that songwriters get paid. It's still not back to the way it was prior before streaming, but it is a lot better than it was. So there's been definitely bumps in songwriting, songwriter revenue. Um, I think that there's like a whole bunch of things where, whether it's like artists taking publishing when they didn't write on songs, um, producers taking too much publishing when they, when, when they, because they, they think they get more because they're a producer instead of, you know, the, the, you know, kind of, um, delineating between the, the two roles producer and songwriter and and you know there's other things like that in addition to advocacy that could help songwriters get paid what they should be getting paid um but um but really the fight ends up usually being with the with the dsps with with spotify and them right you know i mean spotify now is you know kind of like sneak attack everybody earlier this year with this new bundling thing that they did where they bundled audiobooks with with uh with songs and didn't change the pricing and you know if if we can't get that fixed i know that nmpa the publishers and the songwriters are basically suing spotify um uh as is the mlc but you know if they can't get it fixed it could be a, you know approximately 150 million dollars less money for songwriters you know um and it's like we're back to square one again i just feel like somehow because of old, really old, hundred-year-old le legislation that's really hard to change, it's become you know songwriters have kind of gotten gotten the shit end of this streaming stick, and uh, it's like they didn't have a seat at the table when when everybody decided how to carve it up in the first place, and so um, you know I, I think it's 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 something that mostly the public doesn't know about, and I think that's I think that is that is part of it, you know I, I'm always saying that like you know. People, politicians want to get reelected. <laughs> and if their constituents think it's important that songwriters should get paid, then they'll think it's important that songwriters should get paid. <laughs> but if they don't, if, the, if their constituents don't even know about it, you know, or they hear like, oh, songwriters are complaining about getting paid. Poor songwriters, look at Taylor Swift. But no, not Taylor Swift's an artist. And she gets paid a ton, she tours. You know, the thing is, a songwriter writes a song they don't get paid up front like producers. They don't get a back end royalty like producers. And then the artists who have the lion's share of the royalty then go out and get to tour, sell merch, get brand deals, right? Like, and, and so songwriters already have the least amount of way to make money on their songs. And then, and, and then in addition, legislatively, they're, they get paid the least. So, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to say what you what you all could do. I mean, I think it's really, really just learning more about like what what it is and when it comes time to, you know, um, electing officials and being involved in that way. I mean, really understand that like, who is for creators rights, who's fighting to put, you know, they've cut, especially in California and other states, they've cut, you know, create, cre you know, uh, music education from schools, you know, like there's just there's just 
there's just not a lot of there's not a lot of support in, in right now for music creators and for songwriters. And I think it's really just about getting in the world out there and support where you can. Second to last question. You mentioned the artists are making the songwriters are making the, the least amount of money from their song songs. Yeah. What do songwriters get paid for? Like when you break it down from a technical standpoint versus the artist and the producer? Um, yeah. I mean like the this like the streaming pie I think is like what is the latest one? It's 17%, something like that, where like songwriters and publishers are getting that and then the artists and labels get the re get the rest of it. It's like it's it's it's, it's, it's and then you remember the songwriters are splitting that with the publishers. Um, it's all you know. It's it's way it's way less. Also, on top of it, because of because of the um, because of the laws and because of, because of the 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 law set forth by the copyright royalty board, publishing gets paid less than recording. Recording gets paid, you know, because they're under the constraints of 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 these of these laws and of the of the of the of the judgment of the law, of the CRB, the Copyright Loyalty Board, where the labels can have make their own deals directly with with their with the DSPs. They have free market, right? Like they have a, they, have, they have the ability to make free market uh, uh, agreements, whereas songwriters are beholden to these laws that the government oversees. And and the people that lobby against the copyright royalty board are you know Apple and Google and, and people with billions of dollars who have money to lobby against it and so it's this it's just it's just this crazy this this crazy situation that we find ourselves in because of these laws that existed before streaming that have now been adapted to uh, to to kind of be used against us in the streaming what in the streaming world. Wow. Yeah. I don't really hear Apple and Google brought into these conversations. Yeah. I mean, everybody wants to point. I mean, Spotify is like the death star, but like, um, yeah. it's, uh, you know, Google actually pays the least. YouTube pays the least. They all pay differently. Apple actually yeah. pays the most. Apple's like the most friend of the songwriter streaming services. <laughs> but more, more people are on Spotify and YouTube and then, and they pay the least. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, there's so many things that, you know, I would love to ask you because just there's so many parts of your story. Maybe you can come back one time um, or, or again sometime in the future, but uh, we really appreciate everything you've uh, uh, just offered so far. I think our audience is going to provide a lot of value. I mean, get a lot of value from this. If you could just leave us with, you know, one piece of business advice specifically for the artists and songwriters out there. I think it'll be beautiful. God, it's so hard to pick one. Uh, well, I mean, it's so different for each, for each person, right? I mean, like for each, each, you know, whether you're in the business side or, or you're an artist or you're a writer, honestly, I'll give you one that I think transcends, you know, all three. Um, find and build and nurture your community. Community is everything. I think no one can do it on their own. I think it is so important that you find your, your people and they don't have to do exactly what you do. You know, I think it's I think it's important that you have a community of people and then you have, if you're an artist, you build a community of fans. And if you're a writer, you build a community of artists. And if you're a business person, you build a community of other business people that you know that you can support and that they'll support you. I think it's really important because it gets really hard, man. It's really hard, and it's like you gotta find like like people that have your back, and that you have their back. And I think community begets more community. And when you're an artist, that becomes your fan base after a while, right? Like the, the word extends from there. And when you're a songwriter, that becomes the artists that you end up writing the most songs for, you know. And when you're on the business side, that becomes the people who, who are there to mentor you. And I think I think um, I think prioritize community. Love it. Love it. That was amazing, man. I really appreciate awesome. this conversation. Yeah, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. I feel like we touched on, touch on so many things. Oh. Like... No, this is great. <laughs> it's really great. Thank you guys it's for having me. It's a great one.
Yeah, really appreciate it. Appreciate you for watching. If you like content like this, you'll love seeing our music marketing strategies that we use as an agency to actually blow up artists to millions and even billions of streams that are available for free at nolabelsnecessary.com. And the cool part about it that's going to really make you love it is we don't have to be all entertaining and add all this fluff just to get some views that we do on YouTube. We get straight to the information. There's play by play and courses that give you a breakdown of every step that you should do to get success. And you have the ability to have communication with us. We get on live talks, a lot of cool things for members, and it's free just to hop in. So check it out right now at nolabelsnecessary.com.